John, I've followed the development of the multiverse almost from its uh, start in the last uh, several decades and seen it gone from what science fiction to philosophy to metaphysics, physics, uh, to serious physics related to inflation theory, and now seemingly to conventional wisdom. So, and, that, and it's been challenged, of course, even recently. So um, within this whole landscape, you, you have uh, done some work in, in creating uh, so-called counterfactual universes within the, within the multiverse and to see how they would work relative to this universe in life. I, I want to understand how that works. Okay, well, all I've done is, is really explore the very simplest possibility, right? which is really that you can imagine taking copies of our own universe and changing just one thing in them. I mean, that's, that's the, the you know, kind of entry-level game. Yeah. But already that's complicated enough. But you know, physicists like to isolate these, these simplest sure. models, you know, the spherical cow, as we call them, <laughs> to, to see how the basic principles work. And also, it allows you to focus on the parameter where I think the stakes are highest, which is the vacuum energy. Okay, so this is really just taking the, the basic idea that, that Weinberg suggested back in the, in, in the late 80s, and making it a bit more explicit. So there he was, he was making an anthropic argument just in terms of, of relative probabilities. He wasn't saying quite as explicitly as we would today that, that you could actually have a physical ensemble mm. of, of distinct universes. You know, it's a bit like the difference between saying I've got a coin, probability of tossing it is been getting heads as a half, and actually tossing yeah. it a lot of times. So let's say you, you take a lot of copies of the universe at very high redshift, at a time, say, when the microwave background was generated, when things were about a thousand times smaller than at present. At that stage, the universe really doesn't know that there's a vacuum density. It has no impact on the dynamics because whatsever. The, the ratio of matter yeah, to that's space right. is... Because it's, it's about one billionth of, of the energy density of, of the universe. So you could make it 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000 times larger. The, you can make the, the vacuum the, the density. Dark, the, yeah. the dark energy. The dark energy, the vacuum density, right, thing, could, right. could be hugely boosted at that, right. those early Doesn't times. Matter. And so far, you've got a universe that, that, that has not materially changed. But now you follow these through, through into the future. What, future what's, from then. From, yeah, <laughs> from, from then towards us. Yeah, yeah. So universes such as ours contain imprinted in its seed fluctuations in density, small wrinkles in the background space-time that perhaps come from inflation, perhaps not, we, we don't know for sure, but they're certainly there. And so you can ask, how do those develop? And they develop by gravitational instability. So where there's more matter in the universe, extra gravity sucks matter in, you know, the rich get richer, <laughs> and eventually that hierarchical collapse generates ever denser objects until we, we end up with us. You know, here we are, that's 30 powers of 10 mm -hmm. denser than the universe on average. Right, yeah. And yet it started out with a fluctuation that was a fraction of a percent in density. Right. So one of the things I do professionally is follow that whole process of structure formation. And the interesting thing about having a cosmological constant is once it starts to become dominant, which it does, it because it stays constant in its density with time, the density of ordinary matter just falls. As you're Eventually, yeah. it's diluted away as the Not universe really, gets bigger. Right. But that doesn't happen to the vacuum. Right, because, because the vacuum is just the empty space. Empty is space is just empty space. It, yeah. it doesn't expand, it doesn't yeah. contract, it just sits there. And, and the more of it that <clears> you have, the, and, uh, the less matter there's in it. Yeah. So in the far future, it's always going to be the case that we become vacuum dominated. And we're just at that point now, today. So we know from... Assuming it remains constant. It, well, of course, one of the things we're trying to measure is whether it really does right. remain constant. Right. And we know empirically that, say, over the last factor two or three expansion of the universe, the density of the vacuum hasn't changed by more than about 10%. So future experiments that will happen over the next decade will refine that precision to a percent or a, a little below. Mm -hmm. Whether we'll find a deviation or not, you know, it's, it's a matter of great interest to cosmologists. Mm -hmm. but right. There's not much of a deviation. So for sure in the past, the vacuum density was negligibly small relative to the matter, right. in the future it will dominate. And when that happens, the matter's gravity isn't enough to, to suck anymore. So the development of structure, the building up of galaxies, stars, planets and people, will tend to turn off. So it's a question of understanding quantitatively how big a cosmological constant you need to, to make things killed in that way. What is, are the implications of that for a multiverse? Well, I'd say it's the other way around. I mean, you can, you, 
like, you can't use these arguments to detect a multiverse. Right. You can't prove it's there. But what you can do is hypothesize that it's there and try to make testable predictions. All right, so you, you allow each of these members of the multiverse to have a different cosmological constant. Um, and then you ask for each one how quickly the structure frees out. So what's the relative number of observers? You know, and relative is an important word because you know, I don't know very much about biology and I sure as anything don't want to start getting into those questions. But what I do know is if I have twice as many planets, whatever an observer is, I have twice as many <laughs> of them. Yeah. So I'm happy that we can argue for the kind of relative weight between low cosmological constant and high cosmological constant universes. And Weinberg's argument seems to, to work out with, with some, some reservations still to be explored. So is it fair to say that each of the tests that you're doing um, for different levels of the cosmological constant, tracing it over time in our universe to see what would happen in our universe, could be a counterfactual yeah, other universe. Yeah, exactly. Counterfactual is the word. You're, you're just saying, let me make something like our universe, but treat some of the constants of, of nature as right. tunable knobs. So each one of the little t changes you make could be another universe within a multiverse. That's, that's, the picture, that's the most concrete picture, that these things really exist out there, and causally separated from our, right. ours in a way that you can ne never actually communicate. But... Um, that you know, it's a picture. I guess you've discussed that it emerges. I would say fairly naturally from, from the, th the, the inflationary theory of initial conditions. I know it, it's not entirely settled. Some people do dispute this quite vigorously. Yeah. But you know, certainly the suggestion of an ensemble of bubbles nucleating out of out, out of inflation is where this idea of, of a concrete ensemble first originated. So with that concrete ensemble, just the little part that you're working with, with the uh, dark energy cons uh, 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 cosmological constant, each one that you test, if you test some changes and they don't make any difference, uh, that, that's a, that could be a universe out there that might be similar to our own, or at least yeah, ab absolutely. life friendly. Um, and others that show that it, it, w it would be life unfriendly pre here. Preci precisely. The, the, the idea is there's a huge range of possibilities for the value of the cosmological constant, and they go actually either side of zero. Mm. Right? Um, small positive or small negative value is possible. Well, and this, uh, this plateau goes on forever, mm. and what we're seeking to say is, are there observational selection effects just driven by the relative probability of creating observers that take that distribution and trim the edges? Mm. So now you have a kind of finite top hat distribution mm -hmm. with zero somewhere in the middle, and the value we observe kind of halfway from the center to the edge of this, this trimming. Mm -hmm. The way the calculations are working out, it tends to make our, our, our value still perhaps smaller than typical, but not ridiculously small, you know, if, if let's say in, in some units, if, 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 if our cosmological constant was one, a density of one in some unit, mm -hmm. and you did these, you started off with a theory that said, well, it could go from 10 to the plus 50 to <laughs> minus 10 to the 50, and I can trim that down by observational selection to only plus or minus 10,000. Yeah, that's well, huge. Well, you've really reined it in, right. but it's still not consistent with observation. Right. You, know, you pick a random number between minus 10,000 <laughs> and plus 10,000, yeah. it's not going to be one. No, for so, sure. you, so that explanation would fail, okay? Right. So what's the implication for the multiverse of the simulations that you've done for this universe, mm. all those different slices? Well, if you, if you take it literally, I'm not saying we can infer from this that the multiverse exists. Right, okay? right. You need to be clear about that. But the picture you're working with is that there's a extraordinarily large number of bubbles, quite like our own, except with different values of the cosmological constant. The vast majority of them are sterile, and there's a small subset of it with cosmological constants close to zero, near to the magnitude of our own, can have life. And that would mean that you know, there's life in this one and in other bubbles that are somewhat similar. But a, a, a very, very small percentage. I mean, the numbers uh, you uh, use, 10 to the minus 50. 10 to the minus 50, let's yeah, say. Yeah, 10 to the yeah. minus 50, and then you go to 10 to the plus or minus yes. 4. That's a difference yeah. of plus or minus 46. Exactly. But, but the whole point about observer selection is it doesn't matter how big a pond you're fishing in. You know, as far as you observing the universe happens, you'll be in the one of the small subset where things work out.